Welcome to Microbiology of Infectious Diseases. I'm Dr. Cummings from Point Loma Nazarene University. This is part two of a three-part video series on antibiotic resistance. In part one, we talked about the difference between uh, what you might call innate resistance but non-susceptibility. Bacteria that either don't have the target for an antibiotic or uh, their permeability in their membrane is so low that the antibiotic can't even get in in the first place. As compared to some sort of acquired uh, resistance, some sort of resistance that uh, is active, where the bacteria, for all intents and purposes, really should be susceptible. The drug should work. The target is there. The membrane is permeable enough that the, the antibiotic can get across. But somehow the bacteria have picked up a way. They've learned a trick genetically to be able to protect themselves from an antibiotic. And then we talked about the, the most common way that those antibiotic resistance genes are transmitted through horizontal gene transfer. Uh, and, and we reminded ourselves of the importance of conjugation and conjugative plasmas. So what we're going to talk about now are the five most common resistance strategies. Now you notice there's only four on this slide because I'm going to save the fifth one for uh, a separate video. That'll be part three to this series, the fifth one, so we can spend a little bit more time on that one. But in this one, we're gonna talk about the first four, efflux pumps. Efflux simply means pumping out. Um, and we'll talk about what it means to efflux a particular antibiotic and how, how pumps can, uh, can save bacteria's lives. Uh, modifying enzymes, enzymes that modify the drug in such a way that uh, the drug no longer works. Maybe it can't bind its target anymore. Something called target protection factors. These are proteins that are produced that can bind to whatever the target happens to be and protect it from the activity of the drug. And then target replacement factors. So uh, some resistance genes simply replace whatever the target of the antibiotic was with a version of that target that is not drug resistant. So often I get questions about, well, where are these genes coming from? Let's not lose track of that, right? We're thinking about plasmids predominantly, circular pieces of DNA that can pretty easily get shuttled around horizontally from one bacterium to the next. They do also get passed on vertically. So if a, if a parent cell has a plasmid, it will make copies and give those copies to its offspring as well. But then it also has, especially if it's a conjugative plasmid, it has the opportunity to transfer the plasmid uh, over to a cell that didn't have it in the first place. Now the majority of what you find on a plasmid, say from here around to here, all this area, is what we call housekeeping genes. Okay, these are backbone genes. These genes are essential for the plasmid to survive, for it to persist, for it to replicate itself, and to control the process of, of transferring to other bacteria. But many plasmids have adapted over time to pick up what we would call an accessory region. Accessory genes are those that aren't essential for the plasmid survival, but they almost always provide some benefit to the host bacteria that's picked up the plasmid. That way the host bacteria doesn't kick the plasmid out. In other words, it's a survival tool for the plasmid itself, right? If you think of it as sort of like a virus, a virus gets in you and me and it gets inside our cells and it replicates and it ruptures the cells and it does damage automatically. A plasmid is like a virus, but a virus that doesn't hurt its host. The plasmid, instead of hurting its host, actually brings benefit to its host cell so that the host cell will go out of its way, genetically speaking, to keep it so that it sticks around and is replicated and is continued to spread. Now, these accessory genes are where we find the antibiotic resistance genes that we're talking about. So an efflux pump, if we talk about that as a resistance strategy, what we're talking about is a gene, okay, so we'll call it gene one, that's found on the accessory region of our plasmid, that when it gets expressed, forms a protein. We'll call it protein one. And that protein, in this case, is an efflux pump. It embeds itself in the cell membrane, and any antibiotic that gets inside gets pumped back out again. Okay, so keep that in mind. The genes that are encoded on the plasmid produce a protein and the protein that's produced carries out each of these different effects that we're gonna be talking about. So let's go through the first four with some examples. 
and then we'll um, we'll we'll wrap that up, and in the third uh, third portion, third part to the series, we'll talk about the fifth one. Okay, so the first is efflux of antibiotic out of the cell. You can look at this slide here, and you can see an efflux pump right here. Somehow the antibiotic gets in, and they've drawn the antibiotic, and this figure is a little pill, but of course it's just a single molecule of whatever the antibiotic is. And the efflux pump gets a hold of it and pumps it out so that the concentration inside the cell remains very low and non-toxic to the bacteria. So efflux pumps, very common. I'm going to show you an example of each of these in just a minute. Uh, number two, chemically modifying antibiotics to inactivate them. This would mean that the, the antibiotic resistance gene, here's our plasmid, here's an antibiotic resistance gene, um, and I'll show you some examples of these. The gene produces an enzyme. That enzyme then grabs the antibiotic and modifies it. It adds some functional group to it that can't, um, that can't uh, allow the antibiotic to be able to function anymore. So in, in the antibiotic's normal state, it can do whatever its job is. It can inhibit whichever those processes you learned about. But when it's been modified, such as a, a functional group added to it, all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. It's like an on-off switch. So that would be chemically modifying the target. Number three, protecting the target. Uh, that's on here somewhere. Um, target alterations. Here we go. <clears throat> so you can see here you've got a protein that's being produced by, I say here, I'm over here on the right-hand side. We've got a protein that's being produced that... Uh, binds to, in this case, a ribosome, so that the antibiotic here can't bind to the ribosome anymore. And the protein itself here is not impacting the ribosome's function. The ribosome can still go ahead and do whatever its job is. So uh, we can replace, or pardon me, we can protect the target of the antibiotic by producing a protein that binds to the target, such as the ribosome. So the ribosome still works, but the antibiotic can no longer interact with it and take it, its uh, activity away. The last one in this video I'll show you an example of is replacing the target. So here they're labeling it alternative enzyme. So if the bacterial enzyme, the natural enzyme, is this guy here, the antibiotic resistance gene actually replaces whatever that enzyme was so that this process, this chemical process that the antibiotic was knocking out, can now continue with a version of the enzyme that is not susceptible to the antibiotic. So think carefully about that one. This one here is specifically the sulfa drugs. And we're gonna see some examples of each of these. We already talked about decreased uptake here as a sort of a, a non-susceptibility. And this one over here, inactivating, breaking apart the enzyme, or pardon me, the antibiotic using an enzyme is one that we're gonna put an entire video onto. Uh, shortly. So real quick, just some examples. Tetracycline, efflux pumps, very, very common efflux pump. And if you remember how efflux pumps work, uh, it, or pardon me, how um, antiporters work, this efflux pump is an antiporter. So out, uh, outside the cell, in this case it's a gram negative, you can tell because there's a periplasm, there are protons accumulated, and they've been accumulated by this, the uh, uh, electron transport chain through cell respiration. And those protons can bind a binding pocket in one conformation. This would be shape number one, if you will. And that by binding that proton, it switches to shape number two. When it switches to shape number two, it releases the proton now in the cytoplasm. And the, the gradient of protons uh, is going to drive this whole process. It's going to provide the energy of this whole process. And when it's facing, when this active site is facing inward, the drug, in this case tetracycline, now finds a pocket that it can bind to. When tetracycline binds to that pocket, it switches back to shape number one again, like we had on the far left. And it no longer wants to hold the tetracycline because it's back in its shape number one, and it releases the tetracycline to the periplasm, and then it can diffuse out of the cell from there. So efflux pumps, such as the tetracycline efflux pump, can work as an antiporter using the proton gradient which will move from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell, and that will drive the tetracycline, in this case, to move from the inside to the outside. So that's an efflux pump example. Modifying enzymes. A great example are the various modifying enzymes for aminoglycoside drugs. 
Um, classic aminoglycoside drug would be uh, gentamicin. Okay. Uh, gentamicin, here's one. This is canamycin. Okay. These uh, aminoglycoside drugs, that's mycin, these aminoglycoside drugs can be modified by various transferases. So the antibiotic resistance gene on the plasmid would get expressed and produce one of these transferases depending on what gene it is. They can transfer an acetyl group. It's a little two-carbon functional group. They can transfer a phosphate group. They can transfer an entire nucleotide to the antibiotic. Or they can transfer methyl, which is just a little CH3 functional group. These are sometimes simply called methylases. But if you take any of these, these uh, big honking functional groups and you stick them anywhere on an antibiotic, like right here is the antibiotic canamycin, <clears throat> and each of these three-letter combinations is a different transferase antibiotic resistance gene that can be found on plasmids, and it's showing you specifically where the different functional groups could be added. So AAC is an aminoglycoside acetyl, uh, acetyl AC transferase, or acetylase you could call it. And what this particular enzyme here does, if this was our enzyme on our antibiotic resistance gene, this enzyme would then add an acetyl group, little two carbon functional group right here to that amino nitrogen, and the canamycin would never work again. It couldn't function to do what it's supposed to do, which is to bind to the ribosome and to take out, um, to take out translation. Same with a phosphor, phosphotransferase, these are the APH genes. A nucleotidyl transferase, an entire nucleotide, an ANT gene from a plasmid can produce this nucleotidyl transferase that can add an, add an entire nucleotide to this hydroxyl group here. So you can see some of these, there's no examples of a methyl transferase on this particular image, but you can get an idea of how um, an antibiotic resistance gene can lead to an enzyme that then modifies with either, either an acetyl group, a phosphor group, a nucleotide, or a methyl group, the antibiotics, so the antibiotic no longer works. Um, DNA, or pardon me, uh, target protection factor. So here's an example of a plasmid down here in the bottom left. And I want you to focus in on QNR, quinolone resistance. This QNR gene, just ignore all the others for now, QNR gene produces uh, a protein that then binds to the target enzyme. If you remember, fluoroquinolones like Cipro, they target DNA replication. Now, how do they do that? DNA replication has a whole variety of enzymes involved, but one in particular is called DNA gyrase. DNA gyrase is essential for DNA replication. Cipro would normally bind to the gyrase and knock it out so that the bacteria can't replicate their DNA anymore. The QNR protein that's produced off this plasmid binds to the DNA gyrase, so the gyrase can still function despite the Cipro being there or the other fluoroquinolone being there. So you get a, a good sense there of, um, of what a, a, a protection, a target protection factor does and what it looks like. And then the last one we'll talk about in this video is when you simply replace the target enzyme. So over here, we've got a short pathway for making folic acid. Okay, and folic acid is a coenzyme that virtually all living things need. You and I get it from our diet. Bacteria make it themselves. And there are two key enzymes, dihydroteroate synthase and dihydrofolate reductase. And typically with the sulfa drugs, we'll combine both a sulfonamide, such as um, sulfa, Methoxazole is the most common with trimethoprim. Sulfamethoxazole binds dihydroteroate synthase and knocks it out. Trimethoprim di binds dihydrofolate reductase and knocks it out. Combined, we knock out the whole pathway for making folic acid for the bacteria. So what do the bacteria do? If they've got the right antibiotic resistance gene, such as Sol1 or Sol2, these antibiotic resistance genes actually replace the dihydroteroate synthase and dihydrofolate reductase with versions that are not susceptible to the sulfa or to the trimethoprim. So it's a whole brand new synthase or reductase 
that is not susceptible to binding by the drugs. So we've completely replaced the target with uh, a resistant version, with an antibiotic resistant version of the target protein. All right, that's a lot to think about. There are five common resistance strategies. You need to review these, watch the video, go online for more information if you need to, cross-reference with your textbook. We have our efflux pumps that are often anti-porters like the tetracycline efflux pumps. We have our drug modification enzymes like the acetyltransferases, phosphotransferases, nucleotidyl transferases, and methylases that we see with macrolide drugs. We have target protection factors like the QNR protein that's produced by some plasmids to protect the DNA gyrase from attack by fluoroquinolone drugs like Cipro. And then we have target replacement factors. And this fourth one, as, as important as it is, really is at this point just, um, just critical for those sulfa drugs. But because we use sulfa drugs so much, it's a really critical resistance strategy. Spend some time on these five before you move on to the very last one. Let me know along the way if you have questions or anything I can clarify.